chapter 9. We have taken a little bit of a break from our series in Nehemiah, but I want to want to finish it up. And uh, I think most of the folks that are here this evening have been here while we have been studying in Nehemiah. And so we'll try to just kind of catch ourselves up to speed. Uh, I was trying to read my notes from the last message that I preached in Nehemiah. I have a magic notebook, and uh, it, it, uh, you can take notes in it, and then you can put it in the microwave. Well, you can take notes in it, and then you can scan the notes, and they go into your uh, Word documents like Microsoft or OneNote or whatever. And then you can put the notebook in the microwave, and it will erase itself. Well, on my vacation, I had my notebook along, and myself or someone else with me put the notebook in the back window. And the window works as well as the microwave does. And so it erased all my notes, but I read the faint scratches the last time I preached in Nehemiah, and I remember preaching about how Nehemiah responded to opposition. You remember that? Remember when Sanballat and Tobiah uh, had threatened Nehemiah, and we just looked at the right way to respond to opposition. Nehemiah didn't let the opposition distract him. He didn't didn't allow. Uh, they said, "You come come meet us and come meet us out in the village here." And he said, "I can't stop doing a great thing and meet you in the village." Uh, and he knew that they intended him some mischief. But he said, "You know, I can't I can't stop doing God's work." And you know, it's real help for me to realize if we're ever going to build anything, if we're ever going to accomplish anything as believers, we have to be unstoppable in our focus. I've realized that in our ministry is imperative for us that we dial back a little bit. We look at what we're doing, and we look at all the good things that can be done. Hey, you need to meet with me. Well, uh, if I meet with you, I can't do the great work that God wants me to do. I can't meet with you. That's what Nehemiah said. You know, as believers, I believe that the greatest tool, the greatest weapon of Satan to distract us is to give us something that we need to do. It keeps us from doing what God created us for. Did you hear me? I believe that one of the greatest tools of Satan to distract us is to give us something to do that keep us, keeps us from doing what God created us for. And do you, are you aware that God made you? He formed you in the belly and knew you. And knowing you, God had a plan for you, had a purpose for you. Listen, uh, you may be here this evening and you're young. Maybe you've just really met the Lord. Maybe it's just this summer that you've been saved. And you're just getting to know God. I want to tell you something. God has something for you, for your life. God has a purpose and a plan. And it is not a great mystery where you can't say, well, God, I don't know what my purpose is. I'm going to try to do this. I'm going to try to do this. I'm going to try to do this. I don't know what my purpose is. No. God wants you to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. And Christ wants to build His church. That's what God wants to do. And God wants to use you to do that. Sometimes in the church, we get distracted. I read something that a preacher said a couple about a year ago. I read it again this year. He said it just almost a year ago. He said, sometimes we are so busy in the ministry putting out fires. By putting out fires, what he means is just, you know, people aren't getting along with each other and you've got to try to, you know, get people to get along like they should. It's just putting out fires and uh, dealing with people that won't grow. He said that we don't, that we don't fulfill the Great Commission. We don't do what God made us for. You know, as a believer, you and I ought to be real careful not to be a distraction from the ministry, from the purpose, from what God's called us to. You know, when you get offended about something, you think, oh, I, you know, get all this sideways about whatever, and that becomes your focus instead of the gospel. Friend, who's using you to do that? Who's using you to be the distraction, you to be the fire? Is it God? I don't think so. And so it's important. Nehemiah said, I can't, I can't stop doing the work. And so the first thing he did was he, he renewed his focus. Uh, but I'd like to look this evening, I'd like to look first of all here, if you found chapter 9, I'm in Esther, and uh, that's, not, that's not Nehemiah, but now I'm in, in Nehemiah chapter 9, toward the end of the chapter, and I want to read a verse that I think is, if you were to just take, take the circumstances of Israel, and just substitute our circumstances this week, you could actually read this verse in a, into our context. I'm not saying that's the context it's written in, but I think you could relate to the context of the children of Israel. This, look at verse 31. Uh, verse 31 of Nehemiah, he's, he's, this is the prayer of the people. Nevertheless, for thy great mercy's sake, thou didst not utterly consume them, nor forsake them, for thou art a gracious and merciful God. 
Well, I feel that way this week, don't you? I feel like, man, God didn't utterly consume us. He's a merciful and gracious God. Verse 32. Now, therefore, our God, the great, the mighty, and the terrible God, who keep His covenant and mercy, let not all the trouble seem little before Thee that hath come upon us, on our kings, on our princes, and on our priests, and on our prophets, and on our fathers, and on all Thy people, since the time of the kings of Assyria unto this day. How be it, Thou art just in all that is brought upon us, for Thou hast done right, but we have done wickedly. Let's pray. Father, God, as we look at the prayer of Israel here, and as we see the progression from the heart of Nehemiah and Nehemiah's need, God, I pray that You would help us to be reminded as believers that it's just because of Your mercy that we ourselves are not consumed. But God, this prayer, God, You're right, You're righteous. Your attributes, Your character, yes, that's what You ought to be. And we ought to be destroyed. But nevertheless, because of Your mercies, God, because of Your mercies, we call on You. We beg of You to work, to move, to forgive, and God, to effectively use our lives, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. If you were to read all of chapter 9, you would see that it just picks up really at the, at the uh, time when Ezra the scribe had gotten up and stood up on that platform, that pulpit. They stood on the platform and he, they found the law of God. And the people said, read us the law of God. And they didn't even know what the Word of God said. By the way, do you know God's Word? Do you know God's Word? You know, there are so many people in our nation today that have a heritage coming from people that used to follow God, used to worship God, their family, their parents, their grandparents, whatever it is. And they say, I don't believe the Bible. I don't believe there's a God. I don't, I don't, I don't. All these things. And you ask them the question, have you read the Bible? Oh, yes, I have. But you begin to ask, okay, tell me what's in it. Do you know most of them couldn't say their books of the Bible, far less tell you what each book had for content. Do you? Do you know what God has said? And these people are realizing after they've called on God, they've asked God to deliver them from bondage. Literally, Jerusalem has been destroyed. They have not been able to exist as a nation because of their captivity, which is a result of their rebellion against God because they hadn't kept God's law. And the tragedy of it in the contemporary time, that is the time that they were living, Nehemiah's day, the tragedy of it was that they were being judged by God for not keeping God's law, and they did not even know what God's law was. Friend, I'll remind you this evening that you and I are guilty whether we know what the law is or what the law isn't. There's no one that's going to be able to stand before God and say, God, I never read the Bible. And God say, well, then in that case, you're not guilty. Sin is sin. And sin is against God. And the Bible says all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And it's up to us to warn people what's in the book, what's in the law. You know, we have churches full of believers, full of believers, that have no idea that they're living in sin because they don't know what's in the Bible. They don't know what's in the law. And every day they get up and they invest zero time in getting in God's Word and reading it. They invest zero time in growing. And zero time in just saying, God, okay, I'm an open book. Read me and tell me what you see. Search me. Know my heart. Try me. See if there be a wicked way in me. Lead me in the way of life everlasting. We don't have that. It's lacking utterly in our churches. Well, we want to decide whether a church is a good church or not. We've all got checklists. What kind of music do they have? What version of the Scripture do they use? Uh, what's their statement of faith? Do they hold to this? Do they hold to that? What's their doctrinal statement? Do they have this program? Do they have that? Who are their associations? But we never ask the question... Do they know God? Friend, I'll say to you this evening that I believe the greatest need today, greater than it's ever been in my lifetime, is the need for revival. We need revival in a greater way than we ever have before. And this book, what we see happening in Nehemiah is happening because of a revival that started with one person. We asked the question in our series. Do you remember the question we asked? If no one had helped to build the wall, what would have happened? Nehemiah would have built it. Remember that? You, you, you young people answered that question, didn't you? Nehemiah would have built it anyway. He would have built that wall. Remember that. I remember our young people saying, you know what? Nehemiah would have just done it anyway. Right. You know, God gives us some Christians that say the gospel ought to be preached. 
And everybody ought to be preaching it, but I'm not going to wait till somebody else does it first. I'm going to tell people what thus saith the Lord. I'm going to preach the Gospel. You know, people ought to be living holy, separated lives. And everybody ought to be doing it. But I'm not going to wait till everybody else does. I'm going to live a holy, separated life. I'm going to tell you something. I think Nehemiah could have built that wall. He had a mind to work. The Bible says the people had a mind to work. Where did they get their mind to work? Let's go back and let's review a little bit. Hold your finger in chapter 9 where you're at there. Let's go back to Ezra chapter, I mean to Nehemiah chapter 1. And look at verse 9 of chapter 1. Uh, uh, you know what? Let, let's go back just, just a bit more. Look at, look at verse 4. This is Nehemiah's prayer of repentance. It came to pass when I heard these words that I sat down. This is the, the word that, the, that Jerusalem was not rebuilt. Do you remember this? So when I heard these words, that I sat down and wept and mourned certain days and fasted and prayed before the God of heaven and said, I beseech thee, O Lord God of heaven, the great and terrible God, that keepeth covenant and mercy for them that love him and observe his commandments. Now, I don't have time to expound on that tonight, but a covenant is a promise that God makes to people. He enters into a covenant sort of like a contract, but it, it has it has bigger meaning because of the fact that the covenant is with God. And when you have a contract with God, it's unbreakable because God can't lie and He can't, he can't break His Word. Right. So a uh, covenant's a bigger deal. And Nehemiah said, now God, you're the God that keeps the covenant. And Nehemiah happened to know about God's covenant with David and with Abraham and with Isaac and with Jacob. And that covenant had to do with national Israel. And by the way, hey, God give us some Jews. Today they would say, God, you got a covenant with my people. I want to be involved with it. What does that mean? Well, first of all, it'll mean Jesus. It'll mean your Messiah. It'll mean accepting, receiving your Messiah. But God, you keep your covenant. What's wrong with it? Why is Israel the way it is? Well, I'll tell you what's wrong with it. We're what's wrong. That's what Nehemiah said. He had a prayer of repentance. God, you keep your covenant and you're merciful. There's no problem with you. Listen to me. Listen to me tonight. You got problems? You have problems? Everybody does, don't they? You have problems? God's not the problem. When you start, if you'll just begin by realizing, I've got problems, but my problems are not God. It's amazing how many people are messed up. But if you were to tell them that they're the problem, it's not my fault I was born in this family. It's not my fault that the person did this. It's not my fault. Not my... No, it's your fault. It's not God's fault. Listen, we're going to see it in just a moment. Well, we actually we won't. If you were to read chapter 9, you would see that God is a God of great wrath and a God of great judgment. And, and the people said, God, you judged us. We broke your law. We didn't keep your law. We didn't know what the law said, and we didn't keep it. And so you judged us just like you said you would. And you were right to judge us. You know what people say today? You know, uh, I think it was Franklin Graham and then uh, the, the guy that, that uh, uh, Cam Kirk Cameron, one of those actor guys, that both of those guys said something like, God's responsible for this storm. And all oh, people, yeah, if God's responsible for the storm, you're saying God's just killing people. Does, there, does anyone deserve to not have God kill them? See, we think, oh, you can't say that. My friend, it's the truth. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. If it were not for God crucifying His Son so that He could have mercy on us, we deserve judgment. And yet everybody has such a hard time. Well, you can't tell people that today. You can't say, oh, you know what? You deserve to have everything you have wiped out. You don't deserve to have the clothes on your back. You don't deserve to have the breath that you breathe. We can't say that. But that's what these people did when they came to a place of revival. And that's what Nehemiah said. Hey, I like that. Uh, Nehemiah said, God, you keep your covenant and your mercy for them that love Him and observe His commandments. Look at verse 7. We have dealt very corruptly against Thee. God, we have done very, very wrong. We have been corrupt against You. And we have not kept the commandments, nor the statutes, nor the judgments which Thou commanded Thy servant Moses. Remember, I beseech Thee, the word that Thou commandest Thy servant Moses, saying, If ye transgress, I'll scatter you abroad among the nations. What? Yes. God told the children of Israel when He said, would you like to enter into a covenant with me? And they said, yes, we would. He said, now here's what will happen if you enter into a covenant with me. 
If you don't keep the law that I give you, then I'm going to scatter you among the nations. Where are the Jews today? The Diaspora. They're scattered among the nations. Why? Because they're not keeping God's covenants. Oh, they're trying hard. Oh, let's get the Aliyah. Let's get everybody to return to Israel. It ain't going to happen, folks. You can get a good population of people over there in Israel and Palestine, and they can be scattered and splattered. Because, friend, they are not keeping God's covenant today, and assembling yourself is just in rebellion, saying, ha ha, God, we're going to do it without you. Not going to happen. When Israel assembles, my friend, they'll assemble because God brings them together. They're not going to do it without you. Now, you Christians are so sidetracked today in prophecy. They're so into all oh, this is prophecy. It is not prophecy today to try to figure out what God is doing with Israel. God is doing nothing with Israel except scattering them until they turn to Him. God's not using Israel today. He's not using Israel today. You say, what's God doing in Israel today? Nada. Scattering them. That's what God's doing with Israel today. Pastor, you know, you know, you better watch what you say because. You know, some people have stepped out and said some things about Israel deserving judgment before. My friend, Israel deserves judgment. They said, God, you'll be our God, we'll be your people, we'll keep your law. And they broke God's law. And here Nehemiah is having a one-man revival. And he said, God, the law of Moses said, if we break your commandments, if we don't keep the covenants, then you're going to scatter us. And that's why I'm over here and not in Israel. Who's wrong for breaking the covenant? God or the Israel? Well, God's kept His covenant. Part of the covenant was, I'll bless you if you, keep, if you honor me. You keep my commandments and I'll honor you and I'll bless you. That's pretty good, isn't it? Mm -hmm. I mean, you read God's law. It's amazing to me. Every, every seventh year they didn't have to work. They literally could just not work for the seventh year and God would just bless them and make sure that they're provided for. How would you like every seventh year to just, okay, this is the year off? That was part of God's covenant. They never kept a single one of those. Nope. Never kept a single one of those years when God said, okay, you trust me and I'll provide for you this year. Never kept a single one of them. Uh, this, our context tonight in chapter 9, they've just kept the, booth, the Feast of Booths for the first time since Joshua died. Joshua, you remember, was the guy that was there when, when God gave the law of Moses. First time they kept the Feast of Booths, the very first time. He said, small wonder we're scattered. Friend, listen to me. If we're ever going to see revival, first of all, we're going to have to look at ourselves and we're going to have to say, wrong, right. I'm wrong. God's right. You know, there are frustrated, angry people that are so upset about injustice because they can't say wrong, right. You know, I've been wronged by people. And I'm okay. You know why? Because I'm wrong and he's right. And it really it doesn't affect me so much what anyone else does to me or to anyone else because I know, hey, listen, <laughs> this, is, this is not Mr. Innocent here. This is Mr. Guilty. He's Mr. Perfect. God's never sinned. God's never done wrong. And he's right to judge. You hear that? If we're going to have revival, we'll begin with that attitude. Now we have come full circle. The walls have been built. The law has been read. The people have come together. and They're reading God's Word and God's law. They're mourning. And now in, in Ezra in chapter 9, in this, not in Ezra, I keep saying the wrong books of the Bible, in Nehemiah in chapter 9, we come to the place where this is not Nehemiah saying this. We see the people saying the very same things Nehemiah said. Verse 30, he said, Yet many years did thou forbear them, and testifies against them by thy spirit and the prophets, Yet would they not give ear, therefore gavest thou them into the hand of the people of the lands. My friend, we've got problems. They're, the problems aren't American. They're just problems. People have got problems. We're messed up. They're voting in Australia about same-sex marriage. They're having a debate about it right now. That's a problem, isn't it? God has an opinion about it. You know, God's not messed up. People are messed up. Isn't it so? God's not messed up. God knows, God knows what's right. He knows what He created man and women to be. He knows what He made marriage to be. God's not messed up. But the whole world is. The whole world's confused. Can't figure out what the truth is. My friend, the problem is, is that they're saying, well, you know what, who is anyone including God to judge me? I'll tell you who He is. He's the Creator. He's the Creator God. He's right to judge. And these very same people who are dispersed have said the reason we've got problems 
is because of our sin. We've sinned against you, God. How did that happen? Well, it started when one man said, you know something, God, I've sinned. And I'm responsible and I repent. One man called out to God for mercy. That man was Nehemiah. And now we have a nation. I think that probably that in the Israel's history there was never a time when the people as a nation desired to see God's hand. Either as judgment or as mercy. But just wanted to see God's hand. You ever been without God? You ever felt as though God has hid His face from you, hidden His face from you? You ever been to that place, my friend? I'll tell you something. You just say, God, I want to see your hand. God, if, if, if your hand judges me, I just judge me. I want to see it. <laughs> Think of the little kids that get lost. How many of y'all have ever been lost in the mall or somewhere? Y'all have been lost where somebody found you, found your parents, and reunited you? I've seen it happen, I, I think, I remember, I can't remember the details, but I think I remember it happening, not with me, but with a sibling of mine when I was a child, someone being lost in the store in the panic. And when that person was found, boy, there were tears. And I remember my mom, I think, is, oh, I lost, I can't, I don't want to say who it was, it wasn't me, but I lost this person going around and then and on the intercom, Susie Price, Will you please go to the layaway desk? We found da da da, you know, such and so sibling who was lost. And when we got to the layaway desk, here's the sibling in tears. Sibling means brother or sister of mine, in tears, crying, and uh, probably going to be in a lot of trouble for being lost. She probably got lost on purpose. And then thought, uh oh, I may never see mom again. And you know something at that point. They went and told. I lost my mom. What's your mom's name? Mom's name. They reunite, reunite them. Well, when you get reunited, you had my mom. You knew you're dead. When mom finds you, that's okay. Got to go through what it takes because I'm lost. Now listen to me for a second. It's a silly illustration. It's kind of funny. But it really hits home when we realize that if God isn't working in your life, my friend, you'd be better off to be judged and see His hand. I mean, even if God had to judge you just so you could know, where's God? You know, there are Christians, I think, that doubt. I think it's a tool of Satan just to keep them in a place where they're just floating, they're just out there, and it's just, they're just not seeing God's hand. Friend, you'd be better off just saying, God, go ahead, judge me so I can know because so I'm still your child. You know, the Bible says that a father, a loving father, he chastens a son. Chastens his son. Chasten means to punish. And you know, I think sometimes we don't want God to work because we don't want to be judged. We don't want God to look too closely with a microscope on our lives and show us this is sin. There are so many Christian games right now. It's so nonsensical right now. How many Christians are playing games about things that belong in a believer's life? You know, it frustrates me too much to argue with Christians about whether or not you ought to go to the movie theater. If a Christian doesn't know whether or not the garbage that Hollywood puts out there, whether or not you ought to be viewing it, and how you ought to do it moderately, or how you ought to handle looking at that garbage, friend, I don't really have a conversation for you. I think you just need to say, God, would you just show me if you can't see it? You know, the same's true with dress. Same's true with music. Same's true with this whole alcohol and drug thing. My goodness. The Bible says wine is a mocker, strong drink is raging, and whosoever is deceived thereby is not wise. But a lot of Christians are arguing that, oh, you know, Jesus made wine. My friend, wine is fruit of the vine. Jesus made fruit of the vine. God's Son never made anything corrupt. Never made anything corrupt. And there's no confusion about that. There's no confusion about that at all. Unless you just don't want to know. Maybe I say, God, just go ahead and show me. God put His finger on some. There are Christians that are alcoholics. They're drunkards because they're playing games whether or not it's right or wrong. You know, I'm sick of hearing Christians talk about things, social evils, as though they're normal. Relationships. What ought to happen between a man and a woman who aren't married? And is this okay? How far can you go? My friend, the Bible says marriage is honorable in all. Which means that anything that isn't marriage is dishonorable and all. That's exactly what the Scripture means. It's not confusing, but a lot of Christians, well, you know, I mean, it's just so much pressure 
From where? Not from heaven, my friend. Not from heaven. Started this evening by saying we need revival. We need revival. That's the need. That's what this church needs. That's what every church needs. And that's what you need. And that's what I need. We need revival. And God to speak to us. For God to renew us. But it's going to start by us voicing the truth of who God is. God, You're righteous and right. You know, I think some of us Christians, we've talked our heads in. We just don't want to fight the fight. We don't want to say God's right. But He is. He is. Pastor, what about, you can name your issue, your social issue, where people will come off and say, you know, any person that says that's a bigot. No, my friend, any person that says that is right. And anyone who says otherwise is a bigot. They're intolerant of righteousness and right. You know, the only thing that's acceptable today is evil. The only thing socially acceptable today is evil. It's amazing how much people are taught things and then when they act out on what they're taught, all of a sudden they've committed a crime. But it shouldn't be a crime. Unless it's perpetrated against the person. I don't want to get graphic or, or uh, discuss that too far. But the reality of it is, is that evil is evil because it's against God. We need to agree with God about it. The end result is that God's people came together and they said God ultimately... In verse 33, Howbeit thou art just in all that is brought upon us. For thou hast done right, but we have done wickedly. You know, most Christians don't know how to repent. We don't even know how to repent. We don't even know how to say, God, you're right, and I'm wicked. The first step in repentance is to acknowledge sin. It's wicked. God, you hate it. It's right for you to hate it. Because it's wicked. And so now we see in verse 35, they acknowledge that their kings, their princes, their priests, and their fathers didn't serve God, didn't obey His commandments. Verse 35, For they have not served Thee in their kingdom, and in Thy great goodness that Thou gavest them, and in the large and fat land which Thou gavest before them, neither turned they from their wicked works. Behold, we are servants this day, and for the land that Thou gavest unto our fathers to eat the fruit thereof and the good thereof, behold, we are servants in it. Why are we servants in the land that you gave us? Why are we servants? You gave us this land, and yet we're just slaves in our own land, in our own country. Why? Because of our wickedness. In verse 38, here's their conclusion. Because of this, we make a sure covenant and write it in our princes and Levites and priests seal unto it. And they wrote their names down. Chapter 10 is a whole list of names of people that said, God, we're going to make this promise to you. And their promise was that they were going to put away their strange wives and they were going to uh, stop stop uh, living like the heathen. And uh, God gave them revival in the land as a result of this as far as we can get this evening. I want to ask a question this evening, practical question or a number of questions. First of all, what are you waiting for? Why can't you be a Nehemiah? Well, Pastor, you ought to be Nehemiah first. Why can't you be a Nehemiah? We're so busy looking at who ought to, we never answer the question of why we are not. Isn't it so? Who ought to have revival? Where should revival begin? By revival, I mean renewing again, being made alive again. Where should revival begin? In your seat. And in my seat. And everybody's waiting for somebody to do something. But we sure doesn't want it to affect us. Well, Pastor, if revival means a, you know, a holiness movement, I don't know if I want to live like that. My friend, it would be really good to have God work in your life, wouldn't it? See God's hand. Whether it's a hand of judgment or a hand of mercy. God, I just want to see it. And I believe this week, I believe Fort Lauderdale Baptist Church to sing God's hand of mercy. And I don't think that's coincidental. God, we want to see your hand. Could we pray and ask God for that? Could we make a covenant with God? God, if you show us your 
God, we'll keep this promise. We'll keep this promise, this book. You know, if you're going to keep the words of this book, you're going to have to read them and find out what's in it, aren't you? Would you make that covenant with God? God, I want, I want to keep the covenant. The words of this book, you better read it. Find out. You know, I don't have to read it to decide whether or not I'll do that, though. You know what? So many Christians are saying, well, you know what, let me read it, find out what's in it, and then I'll decide. Let me just conclude by saying, if you know God... You don't have to worry about what God says. You ever had somebody that you just knew they'd never, they'd never make you do something bad or something evil or something that would hurt you? It's kind of ridiculous sometimes to think somebody that loves you would do something that would hurt you or be evil or not good for you, isn't it? And yet we treat God like that all the time. Well, well God, I know exactly what God's doing, and then I'll tell him whether or not I'll do it. No, God wants just, yes, Lord. I'll do it. And then get in the book and find out what God does, and you'll see a revival. Just like Nehemiah did. Nehemiah said, I, you know, you think Nehemiah knew how this is all going to end up? Do you think Nehemiah knew that the walls were going to be rebuilt, it's going to be a beautiful city, the temple's going to start getting rebuilt, and the people are going to stand up and say, Ezra, read us the law. And they're going to put away their strange wives, and they're going to separate themselves from the idolatry and the wicked pagan practices, and sanctify themselves, set themselves apart to God, and then set them their hand, write their hand, sign a covenant saying, God, I'm signing. I, I got I promise you, I'm gonna obey your law. Do you think Nehemiah hoped that would happen? I think he hoped it'd happen, didn't you? Don't you? Do you think he knew it'd happen? No. Don't you think he should have waited to find out what you know the to you know tested the temperature and find out who's you know, check the pulse. See, see the way things are going and you know, ride the flow. You no, know, Nehemiah said, I'm going. I'm going to see God's hand. And now all these people are saying, I'm going. I'm going to see God's hand. You can do the same thing. The very same thing. You can catch the train and ride it, or you can start the train. We just need to get on it. We need revival. Father, thank you for what you've taught us from your word this evening. I pray that you'd help us to be hungry enough to just want to say, God, wicked, that's me. Righteous, that's you. And God, I need you. I want to see your hand. I acknowledge you for what you are. Everything, I'm all in. Help us do this. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I want to start by taking some prayer requests this evening. Of course, uh, we would be remiss to not mention the people that are already that are still displaced because of the hurricane, and uh, you know our government, uh, I think, behaved somewhat unwisely in starting the whole exodus as early as they did uh, last last week. It's very very irresponsible when you don't know where the hurricane is going to make landfall to displace people. Uh, the, all the folks from Fort Lauderdale took up all the shelters in Naples all the way up through Lakeland. And then those poor folks didn't have a place to go. And of course, our shelters weren't open in the way that they would have been. And so there's a lot of people that have been displaced because of it. And I'm reminded that, that I'm not an anti-government person, but I'm reminded that we really depend on the government. But uh, we don't depend on God very much. And so there are a lot of people that are displaced for different reasons, but they need God's help and God's hand. Pastor Wielander is uh, trying to get to the Keys tomorrow He's in Jacksonville, and he's going to try to make it home, trying to get home. And they're not open up yet to get to Marathon. They can only get as far as Island Marauders so far. And so pray for them, and uh, pray that the Lord would just protect them. They've got three vehicles, some chickens and some fish and some rabbits. And so pray that they make it home safely. That's a lot of logistics when you have three vehicles, chickens, fish, and rabbits trying to get home from a hurricane. Uh, 